Hold the front page. I'm Leonard Opik and welcome to Press Release here on Press TV, where we find the facts, kill the spin, and tell it like it is about the stories making the headlines. This week we'll be looking at tall tales from all around the world and sorting out the reality from the rubbish. First a roundup of the news with events that cause more questions than answers. Following the visit of the world's most peculiar president to the UK, I ask which side should the United Kingdom be on? Donald Trump's or the rest of the world's? As the British Conservatives try to choose a new leader, we wonder what the future holds for a party as divided as the country. And who's been arming the rebels in Syria? Could it maybe have been us? What weirdness, what a week, what a world. Let's get down to the details and separate the political friction from the political fiction. The United Kingdom had the visit from Donald Trump's very favourite politician in all the world, himself. Yes, Daring Don has paid an official visit to the United Kingdom, and even before he landed in London, he had caused controversy. Big Don is America's most controversial president ever. Not only has he rewritten the rules of etiquette, he's also survived longer than any of his enemies expected or feared. And now he's had the honour of a state banquet with the Queen and everything. Now, Mr Trump is not afraid of speaking out. He's used Twitter like a teenager. He's done U-turns about accusations regarding President Putin. And he's even criticised Theresa May over her mishandling of Brexit. And yet he's still in office and in style. Now the President isn't afraid of telling it like he sees it. From the comfort of his great big aeroplane, and even before touching down in the UK, he had branded the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, a loser. I suspect he actually made some friends by doing that. Remember that Khan allowed a stupid big helium balloon of Trump to darken the skies of the capital, which is just as childish as the things Trump is accused of himself. While he was here, that's Trump, not Khan, he went overboard to say the UK is a big friend to the United States. Trade deals have been promised, and he made a special effort to talk up the special relationship. The visit has caused a lot of strong views, with some saying this is the wrong visit, at the wrong time, by the wrong person. But others, like Brexit champion Nigel Farage, and maverick conservative leadership candidate Boris Johnson, who incidentally have both been praised by Trump, seemed rather more pleased to see him. It means there are two distinctive groups now, friends of Donald and enemies of Donald. In fact, the whole world seems to be divided into these two camps. Is it time for the UK to decide which one it's in? Well, so far the British government seems to be trying to be nice to him. There's a lot of positive mood music to say that the Anglo-American relationship will go from strength to strength. But inevitably, there were lots of angry people who seemed to have found the time to go and demonstrate and tell everyone how much they hate him. The thing about Trump is that he's got a great reputation for rather making it up as he goes along. This must be the first world leader who's well acquainted with the Russian premier, the North Korean leader, the British premier, and Nigel Farage as well. Love him or hate him, I mean Donald Trump, this president just keeps leading the news agenda. As far as he's concerned, there's nothing fake about him, just the news. And there was one funny little revelation in all this too. Jeremy Corbyn, Labour's leader, spoke at a demo against Mr Trump. What he didn't mention, but Donald did, was that Mr Corbyn had actually asked for a meeting with the president and Trump had refused. Maybe that's why Corbyn showed up at the anti-Trump demo. Hell hath no fury like a Labour leader scorned. It seems that everyone wants to be the leader of the Conservative Party. Over a dozen MPs put their names forward within two weeks of when Manic May finally admitted it was time to go. The candidates hoping to take over are playing for high stakes. 
by becoming Conservative leader, you also get to be Prime Minister. Imagine that, winning the right to spend all your waking time trying to deliver Brexit, which is actually the reason May lost that job. Now this gets interesting. Each candidate seems to be trying to offer their own distinctive type of conservatism. The differences are amazing. So much so that you might not even realise they're all meant to be in the same party. So with Theresa May now a lame duck Prime Minister, she's almost forgotten as the candidates fight for her job before she's even moved out of Downing Street. And they've started rewriting her policies while she's still trying to carry them out. This feeding frenzy to try and grab power has led to the widest range of possible policy positions a Conservative leadership election has ever seen. You can choose a no-deal Brexiteer, an avid EU Remainer and everything in between. This means the Conservatives are as confused as the Brexit negotiations themselves. And when one of them wins, that's not going to suddenly get everyone to say... OK, fair enough, we can all agree on things now. It's just going to carry on. With this level of disagreement in the Conservatives, whoever wins the election for leader will be trying to lead a divided country with a divided government. It's a news nightmare. But still, let's look on the bright side. With all this trouble in the British government and Trump on top somewhere else, it's a political satirist's dream and they'll be in business for years to come. There might be a war and Britain might go bust, but for people like me, let the good times roll. Once again, it looks like the West has been caught red-handed in Syria. The Syrian government has discovered a large amount of weapons, including missiles, in former militant strongholds. It once again shows beyond doubt that Israel and America have been arming the insurgents, fighting against the government of Syria. While this foreign-backed civil war has failed to oust the existing government, it does show how far the United States and other Western and regional allies have gone to try to destabilize the Syrian government. It also shows how willing the West is to use militants and Takfiri terrorists to fight proxy wars around the world. I mean, in other circumstances, Washington actually fights the very people they're arming to win in Syria. The weaponry is substantial and includes hundreds of thousands of machine gun rounds, explosives, grenades and even a drone that can carry lots of explosives. They've really thrown everything at this and still it's not been going their way. In fact, this seems to be another example of a war America has supported and lost. America would be outraged if other countries armed rebels trying to get rid of the American government. But they seem to see no contradiction in doing this themselves. I like a lot about America. They make nice burgers. The Rocky Mountains also look nice. And they've been responsible for some nice and hilarious entertainers like Laurel and Hardy and the current US president. But that's not really enough to justify the interference we see time and again in local disputes. And disputes which could be settled more easily if America didn't send in the guns. And when it all comes out in the open because someone finds all this weaponry, there's nowhere to go. It's just another example of double standards where America supplies the bullets that shoot its own reputation to pieces. And as usual, I'll make some predictions about what could happen in the weeks ahead. Firstly, following Mr Trump's visit to the UK, Donald's second favourite and equally popular world leader will also come to London, Kim Jong-un. The British Conservative leadership contest will be decided by a referendum and regardless of the outcome, Theresa May will carry on for another three years and the West will try to make peace with President Assad of Syria by claiming when they posted all those weapons, they meant them to go to Damascus in Virginia, USA, not the capital of Syria. And yes, the American Damascus really does exist, population about 814. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching and join me next time for Press Release here on Press TV, the show that takes the political fiction out of the political friction. Hold the front page, but don't trust it.
Trust me.